amazing. It's amazing. The Michael Deacon program. 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 Is the embassy? Is the embassy? Is the embassy? Is the embassy? right now is Mr. Dan Hanley and of course Mr. Doug Green. Welcome back to both of you. Thanks for being here gentlemen. Thank you for having us Michael. I appreciate it. It's a pleasure to be with you again Michael. Thanks again. Absolutely. The pleasure is all mine and right out of the gate I'm going to make a confession. I heard you uh, Dan on the Jimmy Dore show and I got to be honest, I'm a bit perplexed as to why they didn't really advertise the interview and why it wasn't featured on his popular YouTube channel. And if it was, uh, please correct me. No, it wasn't. Uh, it was just on Rumble. But I did also did a program on uh, Redacted with Clayton Morris. Right. He's got that on his YouTube channel. And it's got like 430,000 views so far in seven days. So that one's moving. Understood. I just thought that was kind of outrageous, and I felt as if he didn't really know too much uh, about you, Dan, and the issue at hand. And I apologize to uh, Jimmy Dore in advance if he, if that wasn't the case, rather. But I wasn't really fond well, of that interview. Got to be honest. Really? Why not? I, I he just had this weird demeanor about him right in the beginning, and it rubbed me the wrong way. I'm not sure if uh, you saw that, uh, Doug. I did. It was yeah. Dan did a great job. He did a great I was job. Disappointed that the interview did. I was I was disappointed the interview didn't get the, the exposure it deserved. Uh, that's another thing. That's what I'm talking about. I have no idea why that was, but again, Jimmy Dore. Well, maybe, who knows? Maybe he, was, maybe he was afraid his YouTube channel would get shut down due to the content. My goodness, you know what? That's probably what it was, but he yeah. tried to seem like he was kind of distancing himself from it in a way. Yeah. I'll but tell you what, uh, who knows, Clayton, Morris didn't. Clayton Morris didn't, he went right at it, so, but I appreciate both of them for having me on the phone. Oh yes, of course, because they, they both do have a massive audience, and I'm sure a lot of people that listened to it weren't really hip to uh, anything you were talking about, Dan. Yeah, I don't believe so. That's why we're out here preaching uh, to people about the uninterruptible autopilot. Right, and today you have a different issue to address, I believe. Both of you do. Right. Uh, I mean, we've been on the program several times, Michael, as you know, and we've talked about 9-11 pilot whistleblowers uh, that has a website at 911pilots.org. And the purpose of that organization is to show that there were no Muslim hijackers at the controls of the 9-11 aircraft, so that the aircraft were electronically controlled, hijacked and remotely controlled by a system called the Uninterruptible Autopilot. Uh, I'm not going to get into the rest of what the website uh, and material is. But if you go to 911pilots.org, you can read the, the rest of uh, the website. It's an easy read, and there's videos there you can watch. And we're sure you'll walk away with the same conclusion we had, and that is uh, Muslim hijackers could not possibly have flown the airplane due to their lack of qualification in the airplane and the total inexperience flying airplanes. So, uh, Doug and I got together with a group of other disenfranchised pilots from around the United States, and we're launching uh, another national grassroots effort called the Whistleblowing Airline Pilots Association. And we don't have a domain yet because our website uh, isn't up yet. Our webmaster's been ill. Uh, but uh, WAPA is what, uh, what the name of our organization is. And what we're going to do there is exposed this illegal process that the FAA in collusion with airline, senior airline management have employed over the many decades to illegally ground would-be whistleblower pilots and others trying to bring up safety issues at their airline. And we're bringing them in and we're going to interview them on tape and YouTube the videos and put it out to the, the uh, public. Uh, Doug can get into a little bit more about the program and something called him and his own personal uh, 
story about what's happened with him and the FAA and UPS management. Absolutely. And as of you just heard right now, Doug is still active. And Doug, I got to ask you right off the bat here, would this put, I guess you could say, stress or worry on you in terms of potentially being grounded? Well, you know, everything that we're talking about is substantiated uh, based on facts. These aren't conspiracy theories. These are conspiracy realities based on facts. And so, no, I uh, I, I can't see that, that that would happen because, uh, you know, uh, I've, I've never failed a flight physical in my entire 40 years of flying. Uh, I've never failed a check ride. Um, and so, um, you know, if, if in fact they, they tried, the powers to be tried to retaliate or target me, it'd be quite obvious what the reason is. And it would be a violation of, of, of federal law. So, Understood. I would, again, I would hate to see know, that happen. Laws, the laws are selectively enforced in the United States, unfortunately. Um, but, uh, you know, if it, if, if they tried to go down that road, well, then it's, it's, it's the price that, uh, is worth paying to expose the truth to the uh, American people and the flying public. Absolutely. Well, I hope you have a lawyer in hand just in case <laughs> you never know. Doug, you well, so much those, 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 Go ahead, Doug. Yeah, lawyers are pretty hard to find these days because nor normally, you know, once once they find out who your lawyer is, they have more money than we do. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I was, yeah, they tried to I go was, down the same... No, no my I was, situation, I was involving... Uh, I was exposing lapses in the security system post-9-11 in the 2002-2003 time frame. And I was warned that if they couldn't get me professionally... Medically, they take me out psychologically, and that's what they did based on trumped up psychological, uh, some trumped up psychological evaluation that claimed I was bipolar, and I had evidence to prove contrary because I had uh, sought the advice and counsel of mental health professionals in the Atlanta area, and I, I had a wealth of evidence to prove my case, but and I took it every level and branch of the U.S. government over a period of five years, and they closed my case without interviewing a single witness or reviewing any of my solid evidence. So I got shafted big time, and Doug did too, and I'll let you, sorry for interrupting, Doug, go ahead. No, that's okay. What, what I was going to say, Michael, is the consequences and the collateral damage of 9-11 uh, has been an enormous chilling effect on the entire airline industry. Uh, between pilots, cabin crew, mechanics, and if anybody tries to speak out uh, pertaining to, to 9-11 and in general safety and security of the airline, uh, with the assistance of the FAA, the uh, airlines have uh, aided and abetted to target pilots. And, and the chilling effect that we're talking about is one of the reasons that, you know, hundreds of thousands of pilots uh, did not speak out about the false narrative of 9-11 because they were afraid to be labeled a conspiracy theorist because they've tried to associate that uh, that name, that horrible label of critical thinking people as people that, you know, have uh, problems, you know. And, and as Dan told you, when he raised his concerns, uh, safety and security concerns after 9-11, they went after him uh, first professionally and then um, medically, and then they tried to allege uh, psychological problems, which was nonsense. Well, Michael, there's 300,000 pilots in the world, and not one single pilot was permitted to testify before the 9-11 Commission because a man named Philip Zelikow, the executive director of the 9-11 Commission, ensured that that wouldn't happen because had they gone forward uh, with their testimony, 9 -11, the 9-11 Commission would have fallen on its butt because these pilots weren't qualified. But I'm not sure, even if they were given the opportunity, how many pilots would have stepped forward with their testimony before the Commission because of the system, this illegal system, this process of elimination of pilots to speak now. So it's tragic. And the American public hopped on an airplane, strapped it to their butt, thinking they're safe and secure, that the pilots in the left and right seats of those aircraft will speak out if they see a safety concern. Well, trivial, trivial problems and uh, safety concerns that they have may go through the normal process. They've got something called 
Applied Safety Awareness Report that pilots can submit. And they also have an FAA whistleblower report that they can submit. And that's what the airlines and the FAA will say, hey, come on, we have a, a communication medium where they can report these things. But the system is corrupt. And Doug can expand on this. And if you file one of these things and it's a serious offense, they're going to bury it. And the unions aren't going to protect you either, which is the case with me. They were, they told me before I filed these flight safety awareness reports, they weren't going to follow me in very far. And they didn't. They turned a blind eye to what was happening to me and let me, allowed me to get my family, my career, my reputation, and my finances flushed down the toilet. And let me give you an example of somebody that was reporting things up. There's a United Airlines captain named Philip Marshall. He was a 767 captain, and he had written two books on 9-11 and was about to publish the third one. And he told his ex-wife and his neighbors he was being threatened because they knew about this book he was going to publish. And sometime later, the neighbors found his family dog and two teenage kids shot to death in their family home and Philip had a bullet in his head, and they claimed it was a murder-suicide that Philip shot his dog and two kids and then turned the gun on himself. But curiously enough, the manuscript from his book was missing from the uh, his home, and the uh, California Attorney General that refused to further investigate this case was a woman named Kamala Harris, Vice President of the United States. So uh, it's... Uh, if there's a there's a documentary out called Un, the unthinkable the case of uh captain philip marshall and that's spelled with two l's uh, and uh it's on youtube and i strongly encourage you to go watch that video because you'll agree that he was snubbed amazing i'll have to definitely look that up and of course we just passed another 9 11 anniversary just eight days ago right I've been getting interview requests. As a matter of fact, later today, I've got one in Australia. People are keen to learn about uh, the truth regarding 9-11. Unfortunately, uh, the U.S. government and other Western governments will never open a criminal investigation into 9-11, even though there's never the 9-11 Commission didn't constitute a criminal investigation. There's never been one since 9-11. Right. Uh, and they won't open one because of their complicity in the crime. And with that said, do you think perhaps the public now, the general public, is becoming more suspicious? And I guess they're becoming highly suspicious, rather, especially the things that happened the last couple of years here in around the world, rather. And do you think they're becoming much more, I guess, open-minded to what may or may not have happened that morning? What do you think, John? I think that, uh, you know, people are becoming much more aware of the facts uh, that surround the reality of 9-11 in today's day and age than they ever did uh, when it first happened. Oh, my. Without yes. a doubt. You couldn't even talk about any of these sort of things uh, post 9-11. You were basically looked at like a uh, traitor of sorts if you question the, the official narrative. Well, as a matter of fact, if you don't mind, I'd like to chime in. Yeah, go that. ahead. I've been, I've been giving that a lot of thought. I've been giving that a lot of thought lately, and you know, the powers to be in the uh, U.S. government, in in every you know relative department, with an emphasis on the Department of Transportation uh, and the FAA, which falls under the jurisdiction of the Department of Transportation. You know, these people know the facts. These facts that that have been presented are absolutely. Undisputed, um, they they the facts show the reality of what happened. I mean, and to insult the average person's intelligence to suggest a conspiracy theory is preposterous. And so what they do is they try to label people as a 9/11 truther or a conspiracy theorist, and and in doing so, they try to discredit anybody that exercises critical thinking based on facts to substantiate the truth. And we need to expose the truth. We need a proper investigation. But when this type of rhetoric comes from people like the secretary for the Department of Transportation, uh, labeling people that would you know, discuss the facts of 9-11 versus the false narrative, 
it's it's abominable and it and it just shows that they're complicit and it shows that the reason we have such huge safety and security concerns in the airline industry is because the entire system is rigged and they just don't really care about safety and and that's what as pilots that's what we're faced with when we try to to do our job and be professional and protect uh, those passengers the flying public that rely on us to do our job right I michael think, yes sir I, uh, myself and the group 911pilot.org, 911pilot whistleblowers, over the past three years have written letters, sent emails, and made unreturned phone calls to every relevant level and branch of the U.S. government, starting with the president, the director of national intelligence, the assistant attorney general, criminal division, the FAA, the secretary of transportation, etc., to no avail. They won't even respond to emails or letters we even went outside yeah we went outside the country to foreign muslim countries petitioning them to look at our evidence that the uninterruptible autopilot system was employed uh, and they won't even respond and the reason is the forces that were behind 9-11 were not just george bush dick cheney and donald rumsfeld they were the most powerful wealthy ruthless subhumans on the planet earth that called in the 9-11 hit. And I'm talking about, uh, you can go to the Freemasons, the 12 bloodline families, the Committee of 300, on down the line, the Rothschilds, Rockefellers, all were behind the 9-11 hit. And no one's going to go up against them. Very few world leaders have gone up against this powerful force for fear of being eliminated or having their country's uh, uh, economy destroyed. So. That's the question you have to ask is, uh, where do you take the information you have? Who's going to adjudicate your allegations? In our situation, we were claiming the uninterruptible autopilot was employed on 9-11. And for those who aren't familiar with that system, it enables a remote source to take complete control of an aircraft autopilot and flight management system on the aircraft in flight and direct, and direct it to any one of 108 airports in the world or into buildings. And that's what we're saying. We're saying the hijackers were not qualified to fly the aircraft and were too inexperienced uh, and that this system necessarily had to have been employed on 9-11. And I had, did have one discussion on the phone about a half hour with an FAA attorney named Russ Christensen. And I was explaining the system. Of course, he knew about it because he had re- in a receipt of all these letters and emails. And he said, Dan, you haven't shown the uninterruptible autopilot was employed. And I said, yes, but we've shown that Hani Hanjur was unqualified to fly the airplane. As a matter of fact, he was denied rental of a single engine Cessna 172 after flunking three check rides on the aircraft uh, one month prior to 9-11. So he basically couldn't fly. And the F- I mean, the uh, 9-11 commission, the FBI concealed this uh, back before the 9-11 commission. So I said, yeah, but we've proven Hani Hanger couldn't have flown it. How did American 77 hit the Pentagon? There was a long pause in the conversation and he said, go to the Department of Justice. The FAA does not handle criminal investigations. And I pointed out to him that we have been to every level and branch of the Department of Justice, including the FBI, without a response. And he didn't have an answer for that. So. There's nowhere to take this information. And it's similar with what Doug's going to talk about his case in a program called HIM and how the airlines and the FAA use this, uh, this program to eliminate pilots. Absolutely. And both of you gentlemen have uh, uh, so many hours uh, of flight time, and neither one of you could have performed the maneuvers that were performed that, performed that Tuesday morning. Absolutely. I've got... Uh, <clears throat> 20,000 flight hours over a 35 year career span and 15 different aircraft. In particular, I could not have flown the uh, 911 flight profiles. And Doug has comparable flight experience, and he'll back me on that one. Yeah, that's for sure. You know, I have uh, seven different type ratings. Uh, I was, I've been to aircraft accident investigation school. Uh, I was also a uh, federal flight deck officer in good standing for eight years as a result of 9-11. And I'd like to elaborate on that in just a moment. 
But uh, in addition, uh, I have uh, approximately a little over 25,000 hours of flight time. Oh, um, and with, as I said, seven different type ratings, I flew the airplanes that were involved, the 757 and the 767, currently flying the 777. Uh, so no, absolutely not. Those maneuvers could not have been pulled off. Um, we talked about this before, Michael. You know, the aircraft exceeded the max structural airspeed. Uh, of, of approximately 110 knots above the max structural airspeed. The cornering velocity on those airplanes and the turns that were made were, would be virtually impossible for a pilot to make. Uh, hence, you know, the uh, Boeing unerupts about autopilot. By the way, I wanted to tag back to something I, I asked both of you gentlemen about the general public and 9-11. Most likely more of the inquisitive minds out there, which is a smaller uh, demographic, I was going to say a smaller dynamic. But yes, you could label that uh, in that way, a smaller dynamic, a smaller demographic out there that are highly inquisitive and have been questioning this since day one. But now most of America has caught up to those. And I reached out to a attorney of, uh, at law. He also hit me with the whole conspiracy theorist sort of thing as well and was starting to question me about uh, my thoughts and beliefs and I thought that was pretty hilarious but yes there are still those people out there that still fully believe in the official narrative uh, Dan and Doug I have four sisters that do and they're so concerned about what I'm out here saying and doing that they won't allow me to talk about it on the phone for fear it's being tapped by the NSA and the FBI Joint Terrorist Task Force is going to come in and kick their door down, take their hard drive, and arrest them as a domestic, domestic terrorist. So that's not paranoia. But there are people that uh, still believe the official story, and they've got their head in the sand. It's cognitive dissonance. It's beyond their capability to imagine that the U.S. government and other friendly governments could have been complicit in the planning and execution of these crimes. So they chose to ignore the strong evidence that proves that and uh, go about their business. It's like, uh, leave me alone. I got my wife and kids. I got a job, family car, two vacations a year. I'm content. I don't want to hear about it. So right. It's, it's unfortunate. It's pretty amazing, really. And never forget Operation Iraqi Freedom and never forget George Bush, who went on a rampage trying to incite an invasion of Iraq just hours after his inauguration, by the way. And of course, never forget about Mr. Dick Cheney, who was also saying that Saddam Hussein had no doubt in his mind uh, weapons of mass destruction right exactly you know well it's interesting that it's it's interesting that you say you say that michael because you know a lot of people i don't think they understand who really was behind this and 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 it's because you know what's going on in the world that we live in today uh we see this occupation in palestine and and but the real occupation and the reason uh, this this genocide is occurring in Palestine is because the real occupation is in the United States uh, and 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 the uh, Zionist influence over our government. I you know the U United States is referred to as the USA. I, I most people are starting to catch on to the buzz phrase of the USI, the United States of Israel, or Zog, Zionist occupied government. And it, and and this is a fact. I mean, if you look at all our relative agencies, um, you know m most people um, in our like, for instance, in the Department of Defense, in the uh, Homeland Security, uh, even at the FAA, um, in our courts, in Congress. I mean, just the list goes, Department of Labor, the list goes on and on and on. Um, indigenous Americans do not occupy very many positions of power. And those that do occupy positions of power in Congress are either being bribed uh, with APAC money, which is American taxpayer dollars that are funneled to Israel and then back to APAC to bribe these people uh, with the threat of having their terms ended after one term if they don't go along to get along or through blackmail. And so, um, you know, for me personally, um, what caused me to start questioning 9-11 right. um, was what I experienced after being ruthlessly targeted by United Parcel Service for voicing my concerns over safety and security at the airline after the horrible and preventable crash of UPS 1354 over fatigue concerns and pilots were afraid to call in fatigue, even though that we were supposed to have a fatigue risk management program. And so, you know, when, uh, when they started to target me as a result of voicing these concerns and they fabricated and manufactured a false case against me, 
I, I really wasn't worried because I thought, well, geez, you know, I believed in the system just like most Americans do, naively do. Um, you know, we've, we've been propagandized and brainwashed from the time of, oh, yes. of birth, you know, out, you know, to when we entered into kindergarten saying the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. It's all it's all propaganda. It's a psyop, really, but yes. But we believe, yes, yes, truly. And we believe that these systems were in effect. It's, in, it's life, liberty, and justice for all. Right. So for me, I had the evidence and the facts to know that this was going to be a slam dunk case. And I thought, wow, what a joke. I'm, we're going to. We're going to destroy them on this one, but the, but then when I realized the whole system was rigged from a from a false arbitration to going through the from the, the district court to the circuit court to the supreme court to going through the uh, Department of Labor and their air whistleblower program then to the FAA, um, I realized the system was absolutely broken. It was absolutely rigged, and I needed to find out why. And it was this very reason that I happened to, to stumble across Dan and my friendship with Dan. Oh. And, uh, and, and so I shared my story with Dan, and, and he said to me, he sent me an email, and I'm actually looking at it right now. It was, it was back in April 9th of 2016, so you can see how long we've been in the trenches you know, trying to find out why our government is broke because of the occupation. And Dan said to me, he says, Doug, I feel your anger, your frustration, betrayal. For seven years, I went through the same pain, writing, calling, and visiting every relevant politician at Capitol Hill in vain. They are all corrupt to the core and could care less about what happened to you. Trust me, I, I have witnessed it all firsthand. With regard to the blood-sucking lawyers, none of them can be trusted. The core system is rigged against you against you before you even walk into the courtroom. UPS will hire the best lawyers money can buy, pay off the judges through channels. Everyone in the Department of Justice, Department of Transportation, the FAA knew of me and my case, as did every relevant congressional committee chairman. It is hopeless, and you are helpless to fight the rigged system. Right. I know you spent a lot of time, money, blood, sweat, and tears, but my honest suggestion to you would be to just hang it up and try the best to move on with the rest of your life and take it on the chin. I know that will never, I will never forget or forgive the government, United Airlines, the Airline Pilots Association Union for what they did for to what they me did to you, exactly. and my once loving family. Absolutely. And, and as Dan you... said, I'm very, Oh, go ahead. just, just in closing, the last line mm -hmm. here that Dan wrote, he said, I'm very bitter and think about it every day and I'll go to my grave hating the above three named institutions. If you can't, if you can't let it go, it'll eat you up inside and turn you upside down. He said, uh, maybe you can, you know, work with a playwright and they'll pick it up, or you can make a documentary movie. All the best, Dan. Now that was in 2016, and then so after Dan wrote that, I started to really dig to see who was in charge of these regulatory agencies, who was at the helm of the Department of Labor, who was at the helm of the FAA and, uh, and, and the, the courts. And, and what we found is, was a Zionist occupied government. It w basically, which was colluding with the dark money airlines who were involved in 9-11. They aided and abetted in the crime. We have Security and Exchange Commission fraud um, between United Airlines and American Airlines. So we know that's true. And so this is what sparked my interest to learn more. And the more I learn, knowledge is power. And, I, and so now we're trying to expose the truth so people can know the truth and pilots can have the freedom to try to enforce safety and security in the airline industry once again. And we can and we can thaw out this chilling effect that's been created. Right. And that's a powerful email, by the way. And uh, Dan, that's a, a great email, my friend, uh, one that will, I'm sure, <laughs> I, I'm sure it will last a lifetime for uh, Doug here. And just to <laughs> and uh, yes, like like Doug said, you know, we all grew up uh, raising our hand to our forehead and doing the whole Pledge of Allegiance. And, you know, we all grew up wanting to sort of uh, fight for the system that's in place in front of us that affects our everyday lives. Yet until you actually get into it with one of these mega corporations, you start to realize that the system is rigged against you. Right. I want to just interject something here, uh, talking about our Whistleblowing Airline Pilots Association. Unfortunately, we don't have a website set up with the Contact Us page. But in the interim, I'm on Twitter 
at Dan Hanley 4 on Facebook, at Dan Hanley, you can message me that way. If you're a pilot who in any way feels they've been illegally uh, retaliated against by their airline or the FAA, just drop us a line because what we're going to do is bring you in, interview you on Zoom, YouTube it, put it out in every social media platform we can find and send it to U.S. government and the media outlets and try to get on programs such as this to emphasize your case. And we'll have a page dedicated to you on our website once we get it up. Nice. So you can share that link as well. So that's, that's what we're trying to do is get the word out. Uh, and Doug, if you want to get into the HEMS program and your personal case, uh, amplify what we're talking about here that'd be great right uh, yeah tell us about that uh doug in a second here but i also wanted to tag back to what you were saying in terms of israel and i'll just throw in the ukraine and, and these sort of things going on in the economy uh, this sort of situation arises when the government prioritizes other nations over its own exactly for sure michael that's exactly what they're doing you know they they you know and, you know and i think they're all tied together you know ukraine um, what's going on in Palestine? They 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 have links that are tied directly together, and you know when when the, the these these paid off traders in Congress that are, in my opinion, just a bunch of APAC whores. Right. APAC being for the, those of our listeners that don't know what APAC is, uh, the American Israel Public Affairs Committee, which was formerly AZCPA, the American Zionist Council on Public Affairs that uh, John F. Kennedy, uh, when he was president, and his brother, Robert Kennedy, who was a U.S. attorney, were trying to make them register under the, the FARA Act of 1938, the Foreign Agent Registration Act of 1938. And and Thomas Massey, a uh, congressman from Kentucky, God bless him, uh, he's, he's one of the only honest uh, elected officials I think we have in Congress. He's, he's also trying to make them register as we still to this day. And uh, Thomas Massey, is a very bold man uh, because he's actually, you know, even put on his door in Congress a warning to those that would try to come uh, to his office and influence uh, him inappropriately. And I want to read to you what it says because this is what we're faced with. This is the real problem. This is why all of our regulatory agencies and our executive branch of government is broken. And, and it's men like Thomas Massey that speak the truth. But on the front of his door, it says, no foreign lobbying. If you enter this office seeking funds on behalf of a foreign nation, you may be in violation of 22 U.S. Code uh, number 611-62, Foreign Agents Registration Act. And then in big, bold letters on the front of his office, it says America first. He doesn't have an Israeli flag uh, that his APEC handler you know, forced him coerced him to put in front of his door. He has an American flag, and, and he has this big sign on his door saying America first. But Tom Massey is one of the few. Most of them are all paid off by APAC, which is money, U.S. taxpayer dollars funneled to Israel uh, to the tune of $10 million a day, and then back to APAC to influence the outcome of our election. And so this is what we're faced with. And and so when you get these dark money, these dark money recipients that are in Congress, you know, um, they're voting and, and passing legislation and, and appointing judges to the court that are co-opted and they support the dark money donors of which APAC and, and the airlines are substantial dark money donors influencing the system that we're supposed to operate within to enforce aviation safety and security as pilots, not to mention countless other regulatory agencies that affect the American worker. Right. And without getting into too much detail, I just want to throw this in here. It has been established that there were as many as 15 drills, either ongoing on 9-11 or directly related to the events that Tuesday morning, by the way, that's what a lot of people don't realize. And uh, most, most of the general public won't ever come to that knowledge. Well, they watch TV. They don't get that information. That's part of the problem. If you go Correct. back to 1983, if you go back to 1983, there were 50 over 50 independent major news outlets in the United States, and today there's only six conglomerates. I think they're all 96 percent of the news you read, see, and hear. And if you look at the management structure of the 
these organizations, these six conglomerates, uh, is dripping with Zionists. And 1983 was the same year that Israel launched the Hezbara project. You can look it up on the internet. It's H A S B A R A. And their intent was to do just that gain control of the U.S. media, to get a stranglehold on it so that they can cast a favorable light on Israel. But, and that's what the U.S. is getting fed on a daily basis, on an hourly basis, by the Zionist owned and controlled mainstream media, as perpetuated by the government propaganda that's spewed out hourly on these news conglomerates. And if people would just turn off their TV, do research, and do a little critical thinking, they get out of their shell that they're living in and maybe get active doing something. I agree. And just by talking about this, we will, all three of us, will be seen as anti-Semitic now. Well, they can go ahead and do that. Uh, I don't care what the Anti-Defamation League labels me. They do not get to define the ter- meaning of the term anti-Semitism for the rest of humanity. They go so far as to say, if you criticize Israel or Zionism, you're anti-Semitic bull. You can take that uh, Jonathan Greenblatt, the director of the ADL, and shove it somewhere. (laughs) We're not buying into it. I agree. Yeah, he's he's the guy that, uh, you know, uh, there was some voice recordings that were released not that long ago uh, in which he had conveyed to Benjamin Milaikowski, a.k.a. Netanyahu, uh, his real name is Milaikowski. His family is originally from Poland. They're not even Semitic to the region. But nonetheless, um, he, he basically told them, we don't have a left-right problem. He says, we, we've got a Gen Z problem, and, it, and it's, it's, it's a TikTok problem. Now, of course, they can criticize China, and they can say all they want about the, the Chinese people and allege that China uh, is trying to use TikTok as a medium to infiltrate the uh, America, which is nonsense, this is just their excuse, to to basically silence uh, dissent and to use the social media platform of TikTok to get the truth out. And Greenblatt himself, you know, uh, admitted that. And and so they went to they've gone to great lengths under the ruse of China interference in in the U.S. government to try to ban TikTok uh, because it's one of the very social medias that they do not control, unlike um, X the relationship with Elon Musk and uh, and the uh, Zionist regime uh, to specifically uh, Netanyahu. He has a very close relationship with him. And then, of course, Meta with Mark Zuckerberg. Uh, so they don't control TikTok. And they, and they want to silence dissent by alleging and passing a bill to, uh, to eliminate it. The, their influence. And Dan, you, you must have read my mind because I was thinking about the Hezbollah project and you uttered it just as I was pulling up some of my notes about the Hezbara project that, uh, you know, I know you're very knowledgeable of. Now, most Americans, they are not knowledgeable. This is the problem. And knowledge is power. And to get this type of a knowledge, you have to study for years and years and years, and you have to dig and read. Um, like most people don't even know what PNAC is, you know, Project for a New American Century. No, of course not. You know, and so, and, and the problem with People lacking this knowledge and understanding what they're faced with, they don't realize that this is just an, the undermining of the rights and freedoms of the American people. Uh, and for instance, the Fourth the Fourth Amendment, unlawful search and seizure without probable cause to be safe in your house's person's papers and effects uh, against unlawful search and seizure. But we can see across the country that people now that are expressing their purported right of free speech, uh, that they, they are now using this the PNAC process and the uh, and the and the development of the Patriot Act to suggest that if we believe now keep in mind when anybody says those two words you know and they're in quotes if we believe that you that means they're lying or it's an excuse if we believe that you're a threat to the national security of the United States of Israel I mean America um, <laughs> now they can basically come and kick your door down in the middle right. of the night shoot your barking dog and, and throw you to the ground with their combat boot on your throat and a, and a M16, you know, in your face. And then they can haul you off into one of their kangaroo courts, you know, with their co-opted uh, judges, you know, their mobbed up judges, as Dan would say, and they'll put you in prison. They will. In the, 
in prison. And this is a wild time. I got to be honest with uh, both of you gentlemen. I mean, the freedom of speech is under attack right now. And other countries are trying to basically tell us what to do. It's unbelievable. We can just, we can cite a couple examples. Like look, for instance, Scott Ritter, Scott Ritter, uh, you know, he, he's, he's an amazing person, former Marine. Uh, he was involved with the, uh, with, with the nuclear energy program and inspecting sites. And, and uh, he's given speeches before Congress. And he's also trying to, you know, mediate between the United States and Russia diplomatically to, uh, to come to some uh, positive relations uh, rather than, you know, advancing the greater Israel project. Right. And, uh, and subsequently, he's been targeted. Uh, Richard Medhurst, Julian Assange. Um, the list goes on and on. There's, there's so many people now that are being, you know, arrested on trumped up charges right. and they're violating their free speech, whether it's in the U.S. or the U.K. or other countries abroad, because these people have so much power and influence. Absolutely. But yes, those, in, those inquisitive minds I'm speaking about, they're on the rise now. I mean, more people are starting to become much more aware and they're becoming highly suspicious of all these things the government first told us about and told us what to think and how to feel and who to fear. And it, it's quite amazing now. And it's the younger generations coming up that are also highly suspicious. And that's something I never thought I'd say about them. But here we are. Right. Well, uh, Michael, I think that half the knack of be, becoming a whistleblower is transcending the fear of death, because that's the worst they can do to you, is kill you. And if you've got to use your religion, your spirituality, your higher self, or whatever propels you forward, do it. Transcend the yeah. fear of death and speak out because that's what's holding you in place right now. You're feared, you, you're afraid for your life or the life of your family. And uh, unless more people don't start speaking, start speaking out, we're doomed. Governments always want to kill someone, as I like to say. And uh, I have right. a question for uh, both of you gentlemen here. As you know, Donald Trump has said a lot of things, and one of the things he said most recently was in regards of 9-11 and opening those files yet again, um, a promise we've heard many politicians make in the past, but none have actually delivered, or none of those things have actually come to fruition, very much like the JFK files he promised as well. Do you think if he is elected, do you think he will actually, would he be allowed to open those 9-11 files that are highly, highly protected? Well, it depends upon your opinion. Donald well, Trump have Doug's opinion that won't happen. Well, you know, in, it, basically, you know, they're all pinos. They serve the same master, okay? Uh, and, and you just have to look at who's bankrolling Donald Trump. You know, I, I don't support either one of them. Uh, we, we, don't, we don't have uh, – when I say pino, it's present in name only. They, they just – they obey their, the same master. Now, who's bankrolling Trump, Okay. Uh, well, APAC is probably enormous sums of money, but even <laughs> well, well, let's let's talk about who's really uh, bankrolling Donald Trump. And that's Mary Madison uh, and sh her husband Sheldon Adelson, who's recently passed away. Uh, they, they're they're extremely wealthy um, Israelis, um, and uh, they own most of the casino, a lot of the casinos in Las Vegas and Macau. Um, and Miriam Adelson, I take a, a special interest in her because she worked collectively with the Sackler family that owns Purdue Pharmaceutical that was responsible for creating enormous opiate crisis. The owners of Purdue Pharmaceutical uh, invented Oxycontin, with the help of Miriam Adelson, invent, invented Oxycontin, hydrocodone, um, codeine, fentanyl for the purposes of creating a worldwide opiate crisis, making billions while killing millions. And this is, um, and a drug addicted American is a better American right. because then they're not informed. They're not, an incarcerated American is a better American because then they're not voting. And Miriam Adelson, she's been bankrolling Trump since 2016. And once again, now in 2020, now he, he, he put, and the promise in 2016 is that he would make, um, Jerusalem, the uh, capital of uh, Israel, and he would put the U.S. embassy uh, in, from Tel Aviv in, into Jerusalem, and he did. And now the promise is that he will, uh, he will clear the Palestinian people 
uh, and allow the occupiers and the settlers to violate UN Security Council resolutions and, and eliminate them from the Golan Heights in the West Bank. This is the, this is the promise that he's already committed to uh, for her to bankroll him in this in this election. And if you look at the history of who Miriam Adelson is, which most Americans don't have a clue who she is, but I know who she is because my son was affected by her 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 contributions to the opiate pandemic oh. in the United States. He was an he was an athlete, a world class gymnast, and he broke his heel and he had to have surgery mm. and they and they gave him the oxycotton painkiller. And like they did to millions of Americans across the country and created the pandemic. They were given these these drugs out like candy. Now Mary Madison, yeah. her, her specialty as a doctor, she's also a doctor, was in drug addiction. And, and substance abuse, and where she did most of her research and, and gained her education, uh, it says that she, when she when she worked she worked in biological research uh, department during her time in the Israeli military. So she's she's from Israel. She's dual citizen. She earned her medical degree from where the Sackler Medical School, at Tel Aviv University. Ah. Sackler Medical School, the same Sackler brothers that own Purdue Pharmaceutical. She went on to become chief internist uh, in 1986. Allison was also associate physician at Rockefeller University, where she began her specialization in chemical dependency and drug addiction. Mm. And it wasn't helping people with substance abuse. It was creating drug abuse. Okay. And it's just unbelievable. If, if, you, if people really dig and they learn what's going on and why, they realize that, you know, there is no person out there that's going to be your savior. To, to for you to elect as president of the United States. I have to, I have you know, to agree, yes. I, I strongly agree with things. you. I, I strongly agree with you, Doug, and I had no idea about your son. Yeah, yeah, it was terrible. And my my former father-in-law, you know, he, he had an injury in an airboating incident up in Alaska, and they say, and he had to have back surgery. Yeah. They gave him the same the same drugs, the Oxycontin, and he died as a result oh, of no. that. Well, I uh, now these are just two very terrible. small examples of mil of millions of Americans across the nation. I'm pretty sure, Michael. I know you're extremely intelligent and you're aware of the Purdue Pharmaceutical. Oh lawsuit. yes, I mean it's the same, almost the same addicting uh, chemicals that are placed in our, our foods as well. That's right. That's right. It all ties together. But, you know, it's time for the American. It's time for the American people to exercise due diligence, and they need to do their homework. They can't yeah. take things for face value on the mainstream media. The Rupert Murdoch controlled mainstream media. Uh, and who is Rupert Murdoch? You know who he is, Michael. Oh, yes. Rupert Murdoch is also a dual citizen. And he's you know, is Israeli and a U.S. citizen. He's formerly from Australia. He owns most of the media in the United States, in the U.K., and Australia. And so, you know, people are being fed the false narratives, you know, to try to direct them down the path. You know, it's it's just unbelievable. It's time for Americans to wake up and realize who the enemy really is, the occupation in our country. That's that's who the enemy is. And until we can get rid of the occupation and have real Americans running our country that aren't paid off or, or bribed. Or blackmail, it's not going to change. It I doesn't agree. matter who's elected. I agree strongly with you on that one, and it, it's almost impossible for me to actually want to vote because I know it's all BS. Exactly. I know. Exactly. Uh, Dan, any thoughts and opinions it on that? It doesn't accomplish anything. Right. Uh, Dan, any thoughts and opinions on uh, this subject here? Well, I agree, and there'll never be a, a criminal investigation in the 9 11, regardless of who is president, because. APAC and the Zionists own the U.S. government from the Oval Office down to the street level politicians. So it's tragic that we have such cowards in Congress, with the exception of Massey, Ilhan Omar, and a few others, that they have uh, betrayed the trust of the U.S. government and our traitors, uh, betrayed the trust of the American taxpayer and their traitors to the United States. I agree. And lots of people out there that will come across this will definitely be on Trump's side. And there's nothing wrong with that. But these are the same people that wonder why things never change. This is the same right. system that, well, you know, like that basically uh, puts them in the place that they're in. And they fight so hard for the system that oppresses them, in other words. Yeah. 
That's true, Michael. And, you know, and but it's the problem we're faced with. And, you know, like, for instance, when I was trying to get honest adjudication with just overwhelming evidence beyond, at the highest standard of evidence, which is beyond reasonable doubt, which is a criminal standard. And uh, when I realized that even with all this evidence, I couldn't get honest adjudication at the Department of Labor. I mean, the Department of Labor, they didn't investigate a single thing. We have we have a FOIA document, Freedom of Information Act document, that clearly shows the investigator violated every single element of the eight elements that were required of a proper investigation. The FAA was never notified. Uh, the FAA didn't conduct an investigation. I'll talk more about that later. Um, but nonetheless, uh, these are all just talking points that these politicians state to try to deceive the American sheeple. I mean, people you know, to believe that this is their go-to guy. Like Trump, he always said, well, I'm going to drain the swamp. I'm going to drain the swamp. Like he didn't define the swamp. He didn't drain the swamp. He made the swamp worse. And you just have to look at all the people that he put in positions of power in his administration. It's no different. It's no different in the, in, in the Biden administration right now. They're all operatives and, and, and they are not following the rule of law. They're not protecting the American worker. Uh, you know, Trump, you know, he, he, I, I saw my benefits as a veteran, a 22-year veteran of the United States Air Force, dismantled. They were completely dismantled. Health care, there's no such thing. It's an, abomin- it's, it's an abominable shame, the health care system in the United States of America. I was forced out of my own country and live in Germany. And in Germany, we have a national health care system. Uh, you know, if, if, you, if my wife, when she had an injury... Um, she needed an MRI in Germany. It's two hundred dollars, the equivalent of two hundred U.S. dollars. In the United States, it's well over ten thousand dollars. Why? And people that have diabetes in the United States pay enormous amounts of money, in excess of three hundred dollars for yeah. a vial of insulin. And in most countries, it's it's free. You know, um, in the U.K., it's fourteen pounds. In Germany, it's free. In Malaysia, it's free. In other parts of the world, it's free. By the way, in the same okay. vein, I do so want to see, quickly see. Uh, mention to you, uh, Doug and Dan, in the same vein, I, I definitely don't want Kamala Harris to be our next president, but that seems to be the main candidate right now, the prime candidate to become the next president, uh, thanks to the system. The mockery of the whole system is ridiculous. He wasn't even the whole qualified. system is. Go ahead, Doug. They're both pinos. They're both, they're both potential pinos, president and name only. And I, and I certainly can't see her acting as a commander in chief. And I certainly can't. And I never saw Trump as a commander in chief. Uh, you know, this guy never he was a draft dodger. Bone spurs Trump putting his little beanie on his head and going over to the wall like every every other one of them, you know, and kissing the wall, showing their subservience to their real master. It doesn't matter whether they're a Republican or a Democrat. It's 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 a uniparty. It's a duopoly uniparty. It's their club. We're not in it. They know who their master is, and that's why Kennedy's no longer with us. Because if if Kennedy was able to accomplish the things he wanted to do to restore some sense of decency to the United States of America, he'd still be with us today as an elderly man up in years, just like Jimmy oh. Carter. Well, he, he might not. He might not still be with us. I guess he'd be pretty old. How old would he be? <laughs> Maybe 100. Jimmy Carter's 99. But anyway. Well, Michael, I just want to ask interject something yes, here sir. that for any politician or bureaucrat or law enforcement official that's listening to this interview, which they will be because we're going to send the link to them to this interview as well as post it on every social media outlet out there. And uh, we just want them to know that we're letting the, not just the American public, but the global population that listens to this interview, what we're all about. and the wrongs that uh, have taken place with our government and won't be corrected until we get rid of the Zionists in control. Correct. And I, on the record, I do want to say that I'm not an anarchist at all. I am just America first. <laughs> yes, of course, Mike. Absolutely. We are too. And you, t- you guys too. too, yes. And uh, We both served with distinction in the U.S. military and got kicked in the teeth by right. the government and our airlines for coming out and speaking the truth. Right. So and, here we are. You haven't shut us up. And on a completely different matter here, but in still in regards to aviation, I wanted to ask both of you this really quickly. Is it actually safe to still fly right now, especially with all the headlines right now 
about tires falling off, about computer systems crashing, uh, just planes just just pretty much uh, dump, just taking a big fat dump in the sky. Is it actually safe right now to, to fly around? Well, I think it's safe, uh, Michael. But let me just mention something here. The 737 MAX, the two airplanes that crashed, that killed over 500 people, okay? Pilots weren't even aware that the system was in the airplane. But surely someone that installed the system or had knowledge of it were aware of possible problems they had with the system. But they would not have dared speak out because of the system in place that would eliminate them. So therein lies the problem. Everybody's afraid of the system. Uh, Doug, your thoughts and opinions on that? I agree with Dan 100%. The chilling effect that's taking place. You just look at cases like Dan and mine and countless others. You know, um, Dan and I, we're working with a handful of pilots right now. Uh, you know, I'm working with the pilot from American Airlines, uh, the Captain Bahi Saliba, who was targeted over the uh, vaccine. I'm working with Captain Mark Noah from United Parcel Service, who was unlawfully terminated due to raising concerns about fatigue. Uh, we're working with, I'm working with a Delta pilot right now. Uh, Marty Bernard, who was targeted with the uh, weaponization of the uh, HIMS program, it's in the airline industry and FA HIMS program stands for Human Intervention Motivation Study Program, fancy acronym for substance abuse. They're using, they're taking a program that's intended to help pilots have substance abuse to weaponize it, to put anybody and everybody in the program to make the perfect compliant pilot, basically one piss test away from losing your job. And the unions aren't protecting pilots uh, because basically the companies have figured out how to conquer the unions, paying them off under the table, and they don't enforce collective bargaining agreements. And so safety is is really uh, a no. It's just a notion of safety. You know, safety is the necessary evil in the airline industry, and they really don't enforce safety. I mean, we could talk. I could give you countless examples, longer, more time than we have. To give you so many instances of right. total, complete breaches in safety, and, and the FAA is allowing it to happen. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, just recently, um, we decided, um, some of the people that I've been working with on, on my case, that we've been pursuing for over 10 years now, we've never walked into a courtroom. Now, keep in mind, Richard Blumenthal, also a dual citizen, from Israel and the United States, Senator Richard Blumenthal, I believe he's from Connecticut. He said every American deserves their day in court. You know, but but guess what? It's been over ten years. I've never walked into tell a courtroom. Him, tell never. Him how much? Tell him how much you spent on legal fees, guys. Well, I spent over half a million dollars. Oh you know? yeah. Now, how many Americans do you know, Michael, that have a half a million dollars lying around just to try and uh, walk into a court of law? Not in today's economy. Beyond reasonable doubt. <laughs> Yeah, in today's yeah, economy, yeah, not sure. not very and many. I had to sell everything I had. You know, I lost I lost both my houses. I had to sell my cars. I went through a divorce because my former wife couldn't couldn't sustain the legal battle anymore because of the uh, the, 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 the it caused problems in our relationship, which is normal. Uh, my kids had to pull out of college. Uh, my son was in flight training that had to stop. Uh, they destroyed my family, but Dan's story is even worse. What they did to his. Well, that's what happens. They, my, they do. Mine, they destroyed a 27 year marriage, which alienated my two kids who were in their teen years, their early 20s, and blamed me for the divorce. They still believe the official 9 11 story, think their dad's a whacked out conspiracy nut, and don't talk to me. I lost $4 million in paid pension and stock. It destroyed my 35 year career in aviation. Sterling career, both 10 years in U.S. Navy, 25 years in the United Airlines, and ruined my reputation as a pilot, all for being on this. I, I was so naive in 2002 when I started down this road, believing that we still had some semblance of a government and that it wasn't as corrupt as it is. And I found out too late in the ballgame just how corrupt it is. As a matter of fact, I was working with the U.S. whistleblower I mean, National Whistleblower Center and the Government Accountability Project in Washington, D.C., which are the biggest whistleblower advocacy groups in the world. And they told me late in the ballgame that if you're a U.S. federal whistleblower, you stand less than a 2% chance of winning a case in the system the way it's set up today. And my friend fired Federal Air Marshal Robert McLean 
who uh, had a similar case to mine, said that you'd stand better chance, better odds at playing the tables in Las Vegas than you do in the current system that exists in the United States today. And the problem that we're faced with, Michael, is that they allege that they, you know, just like the airlines allege um, being proponents of safety, but they're not. I can tell you that. I can. You know, I, I wish we had more time because I would give you so many examples, and that uh, and seeing is believing. But nonetheless, these air whistleblower programs, especially within the aviation, it's called the Air Twenty One Whistleblower Program. That's supposed to be enforced by the Department of Labor, OSHA, and uh, but it's a joke. And Chuck Grassley. You know, he, he, he's he's an old codger senator with no term limits that needs to be put out to pasture. This guy, he's always going around saying that he's a proponent of air whistleblower programs when, in fact, it's all doublespeak. It's all acting. You know, it, just like Tom Massey said, you know, this is all this is all theater. It's all theater because because really the, Grassley knows the truth. The whistleblower programs are actually used to identify people. They want to draw out people that will be willing to rat out the companies when they're compromising safety and security, and then they fire them. That's what they do. This happens at United Parcel Service regularly. And of course, they sweep everything under the carpet, as we're seeing right now in, in my case, Mark Noah's, Captain Mark Noah's case. And then, and, then they, and then what they do is they work their cronies like Ca Captain Houston Mills, who's, who is the uh, vice president of the airline, uh, uh, another DEI candidate of the airline, who just got appointed. And, and air all these things that happened were on Houston Mills' watch at UPS, but yet the FAA just, just appointed him to the Management Advisory Council, which is exactly what UPS wanted, because now they're going to have more legroom to control the FAA even more than they already do. And, and, and I guarantee you, you mark my words, Houston Mills is going to be the first African-American FA administrator because that's where they're going with this guy. He's on the fast track, but he's corrupt as hell. And he, it doesn't matter you know, what the color of your skin is, your national origin. This guy would throw you under the bus in a heartbeat and he'd sell his children into prostitution for money. And, and this is, these are the people that are affecting safety. And the pilots, the safety keepers of the sky's ability to enforce safety. The whole thing, it's, it's all mobbed up. It's unbelievable. And, and nobody knows this until they actually experience it firsthand. Right, right exactly. You know, I, I believed in this. I believed in the system. And I, like I told you earlier, I thought it was going to be a slam dunk. I mean, right. I was laughing at the, at the nonsense that they had manufactured. Because if we were able to put this into a court of law in front of a jury trial, um, we would win probably in less than two hours. You know, just yeah, just Doug, submitting the evidence beyond reasonable doubt. Doug believed in the system until he met me. <laughs> That's what I, I love did. that. I thought it was going to work. I I really did. I thought, wow, this is going to be an easy case to win. You know, and uh, but you normally you never get your case heard unless unless it's a criminal case or unless it's a discrimination case. But guess what? I'm I'm a colored person too. I'm white. I just happen to be white, you know, so, right. so why can't my case be heard? You know, just recently, um, you know, there was a case in, uh, in Washington state and, uh, I'm, I'm just pulling it up as I'm talking to you cause it's very significant and it ties into what we're talking about. Um, there was, um, overt discrimination against another man of color, but he was black. I mean, you know, we all have, there's, I'm white. He was black. We got yellow people, we got red people, we got people of all sorts of different colors. Discrimination's discrimination, regardless of what color you are. Correct. But in Granton versus Grat Grattan versus United Parcel Service, which is a recent case, this guy actually got a jury trial. And, and now why couldn't I get a jury trial? Because the mobbed up judges that Mitch McConnell had appointed through the Federalist Society and then tried to allege they were Trump's judges. They weren't Trump's judges. Not a single one of them were Trump's judges. They were all McConnell and Leonard Leo's judges from the Federalist Society, and they're all mobbed up judges. And they dismissed my case at the district court level, alleging that there were no material facts in dispute. But it was a lie, because there were thousands of material facts in dispute. 
And based on the federal rules of civil procedure, if there's one material fact in dispute, it must go to a jury trial. But see, UPS spent over $6 million to conceal and cover up this case because would they know how much evidence we have in transcripts, audio files, emails, 6,000 pages of discovery that they manufactured this entire case against me because I was the guy that was out there enforcing safety and security on behalf of the flying public. And I'm still doing it every day to this day. I just came back from Hong Kong. I'm flying all over the world. And I am highly regarded and respected as a person that enforces safety and security. But yet, you know, I couldn't even get my day in court. Now, this guy I was telling you about, it was a UPS driver. It says, former U- UPS driver, listen to this, wins $238 million verdict in suit over firing in Washington State. That's Granton versus UPS. Now, I guarantee you, their UPS is going to try to reverse that on appeal. And it's going to go to the higher court. It's going to go to the Supreme Court. And, of course, we have six out of nine justices on the Supreme Court that were appointed by Leonard Leo and the Federal Society via Mitch McConnell. And they're going to overturn that case on behalf of the UPS. That's going to happen. Dollars to donuts, regardless of the color of this guy's skin. Now, But because he happened to be a colored person and he was black, he actually got a jury trial. But a white guy like me with way more evidence than this guy had in his case of absolute discrimination and retaliation and and unfair labor practices, which are called ULPs, I never even was allowed to walk through the doors of the courtroom to judge the credibility of known perjured witnesses, pilots that were coerced to make up false stories about me that I never flew with, but because they were implicated into the HIMSS program, and had substance abuse problems, and we were pilots that had stole tens of thousands of dollars from the company, they had them under their thumb. And, and they basically forced them to make false statements. And we can prove all this. And this is happening right now with Captain Mark Nelson. And it's happening right now with, with Captain Bahis Saliba at American Airlines, who's basically presented a case to the FAA that they're in violation of the Federal Aviation Act of 1958, because they're allowing the airlines to come between the pilot and the FAA, especially with concerning the FAA medical process. Because when they, as Dan said earlier, Michael, what they try to do is first they try to go after you professionally. And that's what UPS did to me. They manufactured all these false statements. I had a perfect work history of of 20 years. And then all of a sudden they try to make me look like this horrible employee, but they couldn't do it. And we have the evidence to prove it's true. But but the evidence doesn't mean a thing. See, th- and this is this is an interesting point as we're sitting here talking. Evidence doesn't mean a thing. Facts doesn't mean a thing if we can't bring those facts to reality and show it to the court of public opinion and or a, a, a court within the uh, of honest adjudication in the United States of America. So that's as Dan said earlier. Where do we go, Michael? With all these overwhelming facts beyond reasonable doubt of any critical thinking person, much less 3,000 architects and engineers of high-rise structures uh, and, and reports from Professor Halsey at the University of Alaska in a Fairbanks showing that these are overwhelming facts that this was an inside job. And we know who did it. And they know who did it. But all of these these minions at every level of adjudication to include the Department of Transportation. We got Pete Buttigieg right now, you know, basically stereotyping somebody. Oh, he's a 9-11 truther. Yeah, well, that just should, goes to show what side of history Pete Buttigieg is on. And he's running the Department of Transportation. And he's got the jurisdiction of the FAA under the Department of Transportation. And so guys like us that want to get the evidence out and real facts, whether it's about 9-11, whether it's about compromising and targeting pilots over safety and security, we can't ever get into a court of law. We can't ever be protected by the government that's stealing our money, right. but yet they're all overseas uh, to kill people. What, what, when you presented yeah. all this evidence recently to the FAA, what was the term that they used? That they denied you. Uh, oh, investigation? yeah. Well, let me let me tell tell your listeners, Michael. You yeah. and your listeners. Um, after ten years 
of, of trying to go through every possible level of honest adjudication, whether it was through the Air 21 program, through the Department of Labor, whether it was to the FAA that never investigated a damn thing. Um, on, on a colleague of mine who was also a, a UPS driver who's extremely intelligent, he was ruthlessly targeted and he's still being targeted by UPS right now because he still works there. They, they, they're, they're retaliating against him now because they know he's been involved mm. in trying to expose truth of my case and others. Wow. Um, subsequently, what happened is we decided, all right, this UPS, the FAA, just so you know how it works, every airline has what we call an FAA certificate management office. Because all the airlines, they have a one, the, the major passenger carrier airlines are 121 certified. Okay. And so the FAA has a UPS certificate management office in Louisville, Kentucky. The FAA has an American Airlines certificate management office. I would surmise it's probably in Dallas. You know, just like United has a, an FAA um, United certificate management office. Where would that be, Dan? Is that in Chicago? Yeah, that's not too far. But yeah, go Dan? Ahead. Yeah. Can you hear me? So I was asking, is that would probably be in Chicago. Yeah, that would, I thought I lost you. That would probably be in Chicago. Okay, so, right. so in any that's case, not, they, have all these certificate manage, they have all these certificate management offices, Michael. And so my colleague, Marty, who's been the gatekeeper of over 6,000 uh, exhibits of evidence that UPS is terrified of, and that's why they spent $6 million to make sure this case never sees the light of a jury trial or courtroom. Um, we decided to send all the evidence to the, to the certificate management office. And in this, and, and, and we sent them overwhelming evidence. If you saw this evidence, Michael, and all your listeners saw this evidence, and if you guys were sitting on a jury trial, we just picked 12 Americans, and we presented the evidence that we share with the FAA, you would say, yeah, this is the highest, meets the highest standard of evidence, evidence beyond reasonable doubt. The FAA aided and abetted in a crime, and it helped UPS cover it up. And every and they came back with a, res, a, a response, an investigation about two weeks ago, and they said in every element, not substantiated, every element not substantiated, and everyone was substantiated. I'm looking at their response right now, and I've already drafted some notes to their response. I've just been so busy flying, and that's what you have to understand. You know, people like us, average Americans, we don't have the money. That, that these dark money corporations have to hire these heavy hitter law firms to do all their dirty work. Um, we don't have that. So, you know, we're still working. I'm still out there, you know, moving the airplane from one flight to the next and in between trying to, you know, defend myself and respond to this and have to study the rule of law under federal rules of civil procedure and appellate procedure and under the FAA rules and the Department of Labor rules. And subsequently, I've already roughed in a response to these guys, and I'll send it to you when I'm done. Because I have your email, and you'll see for yourself. I'll send, I'll send you their response, and I'll send you my response. But every allegation of which they they surmise from all the evidence that we submitted that there were a total of six allegations, which there's actually way more. They just try to water it down. But the allegation one, UPS management coerced two pilots to make false statements because they were aware of DUI. They were aware of DUI convictions the pilots had not properly um, reported to the FAA. And then finding, not substantiated. Allegation two, UPS management personnel submitted false statements and information to FAA aviation medical examiners, which they did. They, and, they, and they're doing that. They've done that in countless other cases of other pilots. John Hurd, um, you know, myself, um, Mark Noah, um, Count, well, Noah really, his, his wasn't so much from a medical perspective. They actually it caused Mark Noah to have a stroke because of the lies that they manufactured about him to end his 30-year career because he was reporting safety and security concerns. Warren Leggett, another guy, he, he actually died because of this. Um, it's unbelievable. And they've been abusing this HIMSS program to the point where they end guys' careers and some pilots, you know, they just can't handle it. They're human beings too. And, and they committed suicide, you know? Um, but in any case, so I told you about allegation number two, this false statement submitted to aviation medical examiners. They're being paid off under the table 
just like Dr. Altman was in Carlene Pettit's case with Delta Airlines, of which Carlene Pettit prevailed in that case because it was a high-profile case involving the former FAA administrator, Steve Dixon, who was the chief pilot at Delta Airlines. It was under his watch that he gave the order to target Carlene Pettit, just like Captain Dan Hanley alleging she was bipolar, even though she has a doctorate degree in safety management systems, and she's wrote seven books, and she's got eight different type ratings or more. It's unbelievable. Yeah. They, so they're weaponizing. That is out of pilot. control. And then it is absolutely out of control. So that allegation, even though it was substantiated, they said not substantiated. Allegation three, UPS management created a perpetual culture of retaliation and hostility towards pilots that reported safety and fatigue concerns leading up to the 2013 uh, crash of, of UPS uh, 1354. And pilots contributing to the investigation were harassed for providing information to the NTSB. And then, and then they're finding on that allegation, not substantiated. Yeah, and, but it was substantiated. It was clearly substantiated. And, and then in allegation four, the FAA wrongly revoked an airman certificate. Uh, cockpit voice recording data was not properly secured for the investigation. Not substantiated. It was absolutely substantiated. Gerald Brown, another pilot at UPS, they manufactured a whole scheme against him because he knew how they were abusing the HIMSS program, the substance abuse program, to target pilots, to put anybody and everybody in the program to make the perfect compliant pilot. You either go along to get along, we do, you do exactly what we tell you to do, or else you're one piss test away from losing your job. And the union was in on it. And we have overwhelming evidence to prove it's true. But the FAA said, not substantiated. Allegation five, UPS Airlines uses the HIMSS program to pressure and coerce participation to make false statements concerning fellow pilots. Not substantiated. It's unbelievable. UPS knowingly, listen to this one, UPS Airlines knowingly falsified Pilot Records Improvement Act documents required records and provided those records, those false records during a PREA and reference checks. Not substantiated. It's, it's total nonsense. UPS FAT tried to blackball me, as they do other pilots, from ever getting a job again if you try to challenge them. And the FAA knows that they sent false statements to a former employer that I work for. And my former employer knew all about UPS and their tactics, but they needed an experienced MD-11 captain, of which I had over 3,000 hours in that airplane. And I completed their training program in minimum time at the Boeing facility in Miami. And they, and they says, well, as far as we're concerned, as long as you're holding a valid first-class medical, this is going in the round five. And they sent me to training, and I finished it in record time, and I was operational in less than 30 days, flying all over the world. But see, this is what they do, and, and, they, and they blackball the pilots. And then we go to the FAA, and, and they're aiding and abetting because they're bought and paid for. Now, I talked to a colleague of mine. Um, in the military that works at that F, worked at that FAA UPS CMO office, and I have overwhelming evidence that he knows the truth of everything that I'm sharing with you, and that they look the other way. So these are just small examples, yeah. Mike. I can feel your frustration, and I understand now wholeheartedly what you've been going through as well as Dan. It's it's insane. Well, my case, my case is over with, Michael. The statute of limitations ran out long ago. But I've written a book along with the co-author and the publisher editor has. Sure. And it's documented what happened to me, not just with regard to my grounding, but with regard to what I've reported to appropriate governmental authorities since then. And my publisher has promised me that they'll get the book published posthumously if I get whacked. So there's a chronicle of events that led up to my grounding. The name of the book it is an outdated, is grounded memoir of a 9-11 pilot whistleblower. And while I'm on that topic, 9-11 uh, pilot whistleblowers uh, last year released a documentary called 9-11, uh, The Advent of the Ninth Crusade. And you can find that easily on our 911pilot.org website. If you go to the drop down menu, it's under documentary. It was uh, pretty. Uh, I wrote the thing, but it was developed and produced by uh, people from all over the world, got together via the internet, and, uh, Dropbox, and other methods to put this uh, film together. So I strongly encourage you watching that because it tell, tells all. It's really 
targeted towards people who still believe the official 9-11 story. So some of the information contained therein may be elementary to those wanting to watch it. So I encourage you to watch it and pass it on to the interested family members, friends, and neighbors. Absolutely. And I do want to thank both of you guys for being a part of the program. And in my closing statement, I just want to say to you and to the audience, don't forget that on 9-11, Benjamin Netanyahu told the New York Times that the terror atrocity was very good for U.S. and Israeli relations. Just keep that in mind. Yeah. Yeah. And that's a good point, Michael. And, and he also, there's there's a video, I actually have the video uh, right in front of me, where he had showcased uh, years, uh, just a few years, a couple years before 9-11. And, and you know, we all know it was a premeditated act. It, it, they were planning this for quite some time and before they actually executed it. Um, you know, we know about the Israelis that were working in the elevator shafts, and they were actually uh, responsible for, you know, pre, pre-positioning the explosive ordnance. There's photos of it. There, there, there's photos of them with the boxes of fuses, you know, where they loaded these buildings and, and to include World Trade Center 7, you know, where Larry Silverstein finally said, just pull it. How do you just pull a building, a building that uh, is, that's been pre-wired uh, for uh, controlled demolition takes a, a, at least a good month or more to prepare that building for controlled demolition. Uh, but he said, just pull it. Well, Netanyahu, um, I really like to call him by his proper name, Benjamin Milaikowski. He uh, he had showcased this false flag um, and uh, he had alluded that, you know, in Congress, you know, that that it, people just don't understand. Uh, and in an interview, people just don't understand extreme Islam and what they're capable of. And, and if and and if the West doesn't wake up, I won't be surprised if they end up blowing up the World Trade Center, you know? And of course, you know, it seems like they always like to showcase what they're going to do up in front, you know? I, I'm not yeah. sure if this is a game, why they why, why they do this, you know? But, but it seems like whenever there's a false flag event, they always showcase it up in front. But right. this country is, the United States is occupied, Michael. It's completely occupied. And these people are not our ally. You know, when they killed John F. Kennedy, when they killed Robert F. Kennedy, when they bombed the USS Liberty, and most people in America have no clue about the USS Liberty. And for all your listeners, I would encourage every single person to Google the USS Liberty and find out the false flag attempt they tried to make to, to, to sell the, the, the destruction of the U.S. Liberty allegedly by Egypt, when in fact it was Israel as a false flag that sell it to the American people, and they had a B-52 sitting on the runway at Beale Air Force Base, already cocked and locked and ready to launch with nuclear warheads, waiting for the word that the USS Liberty has been destroyed. You got the green light. Right. And they were going to go to Egypt, and they were going to annihilate Egypt. Correct. That was okay? back in 1967, by the way. Precisely. But their cover was blown. And, and the B-52 had to stand down. Right. So James Lee, J- James Lee, um, he is an amazing journalist, very much like you, Michael. And he, he gets the truth out. And uh, you can find him on Twitter. I think he's 1549 at James Lee. He has a link to the shorter version. There's a longer documentary version on Rumble about the USS Liberty showing the truth. And we have actual exhibits. They're going to say it was mistaken identity and it was an accident. Right, right, but it's yes. all bullshit <laughs> because we have actual doc, doc, we have actual documents and dialogue that says that even the fighters said, "Hey, this is a U.S. Set ship. This is a U.S. flag. Are you sure you want us to hit it?" He said, "Follow your orders. Take it out." And so, no, this was no mistaken identity. No, not so at all. We're and, not finding that. Right. And, and to add for no, the context, uh, for those who don't know, that's an Israeli aircraft and uh, ships actually attacked the USS Liberty, killing 34 people and wounding 171, I believe. Uh, so they could blame Egypt, as you said. Right. Yeah, yeah. They wanted to blame Egypt to, yeah, they wanted to advance the Greater Israel Project. Now, and, and just to stand corrected, James Lee, if you want to look at that link, he's James on Lee. Twitter. Okay. It's at five. Five at at five one four nine James J A M E S L I James Lee. He's an amazing journalist, and uh, he he summarizes a lot of these false flag events. But once again, you know, is this an ally? 
No, and Lyndon Johnson was in on it. And and he said, I don't care if you kill every one of those sailors and sink that ship, it'd be, it'd be better than embarrassing an ally. Because he was in on it. He was a Zionist whore. And so subsequently, they, they destroyed the USS Liberty. They killed Martin Luther King. They killed Malcolm X. They kill, killed King Faisal in Saudi Arabia. They killed countless other people that spoke out. They're responsible for, there's overwhelming evidence beyond reasonable doubt that shows that they were at the scene of the crime in 9-11. And they have buried our country in debt. Oh, yes. $37 billion in debt right. through the Federal Reserve and usury. And, and so they've destroyed this country. They're no ally. And this is why every relative agency and court and executive branch of our government is co-opted, rigged, bought and paid for against the American people. OK, uh, and I know this. If I Go ahead. I think I think Michael wants to sign off, but I, I don't mean to cut you off. But he said in closing statement a little while ago, when we've been on here. No, it's OK. An hour and a half. No worries. Yeah. I, oh, OK. Yeah, no words. I, I just uh, I, I thought you guys had to get going here. But um, but yes, I do want to thank both of you guys for being a part of the program. And uh, if Dan, you have any parting words and uh, Doug as well. Uh, Dan, let's uh, start with you okay. first. OK, I mentioned it before, but I will again. I'm extremely uh, shadow banned on social media for obvious reasons. But if you're on Twitter or X, my name is Dan Hanley Four. I've got like over 70,000 followers, but I'd like to have over 700 million. So please follow me there. And I may as well not even be on Facebook. I'm so uh, shadow banned, but I'm on Dan Hanley there. So please join me uh, for a continuation of the discussion we had today. Thank you, Michael, for having you got me on. It. Uh, Doug, go ahead. Okay. Well, in closing, um, you know, we've talked about a lot of things, and obviously we could go into greater detail dissect these things properly so that more Americans are aware of what's really going on. But uh, the biggest problem that we have is we have an occupied government and we have a bunch of traitors sitting in Congress. And I just want to read something real quick. It's, it's, it's an oath of allegiance and it talks about when people are traitors and it, it basically uh, addresses 18 U.S. Code 2381 about treason. Whoever owing allegiance to the United States levies war against them or adheres to their enemies, giving them aid and comfort, which is what these these people in Congress are doing. They're giving aid and comfort to the enemy. They, they provide them aid and comfort within the United States or elsewhere is guilty of treason and sh shall suffer death or be in prison and fined and capable of holding any U.S. office. In accordance with the Constitution, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, and among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and that to secure these rights, government are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed, that means the people. But when a long train of abuses and usurpations, pursue, usurpations pursuing invariably the same object invinces a design to reduce them under absolute despotism, which is hopelessness, it is their right, it is their duty to throw off such government and to provide new guards for their future security. And this is the problem. Americans, we need to rise up and we need to hold our elected officials accountable for their tutorious acts in order to provide new guards for our security so that the institutions that we were taught to believe in will come to fruition and they'll actually exist for people like us that are trying to do our jobs, especially pilots, and trying to enforce aviation safety and security, but are denied our rights and due process in a court of law. So, Michael, you are the conduit that gets this information out to the American people because you know it, most of this information is, is suppressed. And we want to thank you for your continued efforts. You're a true patriot, and God bless you. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for being a part of the program. Always a honor and pleasure to share, with, share the air with you, Dan, and you, Doug. And I will see both of you on the other side. Bye-bye.